get started. Um, I'm Mark Spurgeon, I'm CTO of Augmented Expeditions, and we are doing location-based uh, tourism apps. Uh, if you'll notice, we're down a speaker. Um, that would be Marshall Pittman, uh, engineer extraordinaire, who uh, couldn't be here because his uh, uncle Buddy passed away a couple days ago. And uh, his um, contributions to this talk will be missed, but we'll try to cover it. Just your oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my academic background is in both um, humanities, literature, and also computer science, uh, AI, specifically cognitive modeling. So um, it kind of lends itself to uh, app design and game design and engineering. So we have um, been doing some uh, tourism apps for um, Niantic and Google and uh, a Chinese company, Great Wall Tiger, um, using AR and uh, trying to get uh, as close to the experience of the actual sites as possible as opposed to using a map or just uh, superimpose things. We want the, um, the virtual objects to interact with the real objects as closely and precisely as possible. And in outdoors particularly, this has posed some challenges. So um, I'll have Jackie introduce the start of the subject. Actually, I'm gonna introduce myself and then you're gonna... Am I the next slide? Yep, okay. Uh, and my background is, um, is in both fine art and computer science, and I was lucky enough to work in VR for a number of years um, since the late 80s. So uh, it's been a, a wild ride to see all of this uh, VR and AR resurge as it has. And I was lucky enough that Mark came to me a few years ago and said, you know, can we work together somehow? And I went, oh, wow, what a great offer. So um, we've been working together on different kinds of uh, AR for tourism for about three and a half years now. Um, most, late, uh, most recently with a new company, Mark and his wife Pauline have, um, no, I guess fiance yet, um, have founded called Augmented Expeditions. So some of the lessons that we've learned we're gonna talk about today from both that company and a previous company that I had for AR Tourism. Um, so AR for Tourism, um, I think it's one of the application areas for augmented reality that is going to be really huge. I mean, already we see information that is uh, superimposed over your location to tell you what restaurant to eat at, um, you know, that there's something interesting here. It has so many ways to provide information for travelers and tourists. Um, there are, you know, not to say there aren't challenges to overcome because not everybody has the same device. We've got to, you know, make sure that we build for different varieties of smartphones and eventually the headsets. And that pipeline to do that and to do really quality, uh, quali um, quality content is not... Um, it, it's not quick. It's a very, very complicated pipeline. Uh, having developed it for two companies now, uh, we can we can say that. Um, so there are all kinds of functions that we can put into these things, such as um, not only overlays to see maybe what some place looked like in the past, but conversational. Uh, interfaces, characters that can talk to you, AI-assisted navigation. So there's a number of things that we can put in that we'll talk about a little bit more that allow us to give a very quality, meaningful experience to the traveler. Um, the customer base and demand is also huge, and uh, travel is one of the biggest industries out there. Family tourism in the United States alone accounts for about 30% of all tourism in the United States. And it's expected to grow really rapidly. There is now a Family Tourism Research Institute um, that is looking at the numbers and how they're going up. Uh, there is also topic-focused tourism. So you might take an art tour, you might go to museums and, and want to know more information about the objects in that museum. Uh, there are history-focused ones, uh, science tours, uh, religious tours. There's all kinds of tours out there. And I think every, every, um, every subject matter, tourism, could uh, be enhanced with augmented reality. School groups, too, and um, university-sponsored travel. I think there could be a lot of uh, additions there. Uh, who would use this stuff? I mean, you could get to the end user, 
but you can also work with tourism boards and cruise companies and all kinds of things. And what we are looking at is, especially right now with the Augmented Expeditions Company, is a way to help under-attended sites increase their attendance and increase the engagement with the things that are there. Uh, so it's a way to benefit both the site location itself as well as um, the tourists who are coming to visit that site. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mark for some technical challenges. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so uh, I had worked as um, engineer and technical director on a lot of these uh, things before this, but um, working on it from the design side is interesting too. The challenges um, that we've come up with uh, or found in our experience and ways to mitigate them kind of fall into a couple different categories. Uh, there's the challenge of development and getting the pipeline to be efficient um, and also to be reliable and look good. So there's a trade-off usually between that kind of quality and the efficiency, and uh, we found some ways to work with that. Um, the other uh, set of challenges is to make it usable um, in uh, a way that we can appeal and uh, be used by the greatest number of people for the greatest number of purposes. So anyway, to talk about the technical uh, challenges for developers, um, we have um, a lot of stuff coming out, and it's like kind of growing exponentially, the number of uh, companies that are providing development tools, the number of companies that are providing new hardware, and um, new uh, hardware components in kind of known hardware, like uh, 3D cameras for phones and things like that. So it is a moving target. Um, and also the interdependencies, there is not much standardization yet in terms of getting AR um, into uh, kind of like a scalable and um, efficient pipeline, but we're kind of working on that too. And uh, then what we're focusing on for tourism uh, is to make it publicly accessible um, for 24 hours, kind of following the uh, Ingress or Pokemon model from Niantic. And so that requires for us anyway, because we are going to be uh, very location specific as opposed to street map specific, to uh, have the outdoor um, AR be reliable. Uh, so at first, uh, we're definitely going to be focusing on using the 2D marker approach. Even that has its challenges for uh, outdoors. But to get the, the 3D objects themselves to be the targets is even more difficult. So to um, improve the pipeline efficiency, uh, we've kind of come up with um, <clears throat> a way to uh, make the 3D objects um, a little easier to work with in terms of mapping the virtual version of it, which our animated sprites, for instance, can practice on in Unity. And just for the record, we're using uh, Vuforia in Unity, which uh, is going to merge pretty soon. So what we do is we get a good model of the 3D object into the Unity scene, have our virtual objects uh, practice on it for precision, and then uh, calibrate it to the actual object so that it looks like uh, a seamless interaction. So um, what we have to do for efficiency is the contact points for the virtual object and the real object, we don't have to map every single one of them out. So in order to just have um, an efficient pipeline, we just have like, OK, so this is a point of contact. This is a point of occlusion. We don't have to worry about everything else at the same time. Um, so also, there are a few ways to use AI to um, make this a little bit of a smoother thing to have pathing algorithms um, like a nav mesh built on top of the point cloud for the 3D model uh, and do kind of like a supervised training regimen to have the object, um, the virtual object, interact with the, uh, the real model. So we also have to account for uh, times of day and lighting. Uh, with adaptive marker flexibility, and that can slow down the pipeline too. So uh, we've kind of come up with a couple solutions for that. Um, the one that we're using um, <clears throat> currently is to get a number of pictures of the marker at, uh, in different conditions, different occlusion conditions, different lighting conditions, and have an algorithm in Unity to make it so that if any of those is recognized, then the AR is triggered and only triggered once. 
So um, it's it, it works fairly well, but you do have to be like fairly thorough in how many um, pictures you need for that. Okay, so the kind of thing Mark's talking about, so imagine you are in a historic location and there's a monument there, and that monument is, is destined to be your location marker. And that's the thing that, that has to recognize, and it could be a very complicated um, monument. Um, what I want to talk about now is how we can enhance the experience. So beyond the, the technical challenges and the pipeline considerations, there are many, many ways we can enhance a location-based uh, AR tourism experience. Now, we still want to push the tech envelope, of course, but you know those edges are not always reliable, those tech edges. So we want to make sure that we have a solid a a application that we give out so that users are not frustrated while we keep trying to add things um, at, to push that technology edge. So the few tried and true ways we can use uh, to address meaning and value for that tourist experience, one is narrative. Uh, I don't think we think about AR with narrative very much yet. But there's no reason we can't. We can, we can put those objects out there, those enhanced um, augmented pieces of the experience, so that they tell a narrative. And narratives are always engaging. And we can tie those into location things like history, legends, um, things that have happened there that are interesting. I'd love to do a tour of LA for the sort of crazy uh, unsolved murders that have happened there over um, the couple of hundred years. Um, everyone loves a good mystery, so, you know, we could do that. We could we can have the what-ifs. We can have the things that tie you into uh, not only maybe what happened here a hundred years ago, but what if this had happened instead of that, and w where would we, what would we be looking at? Would that monument have a different person on a horse on top of it, or you know, what would, what would this space look like if it had not become, say, the nation's capital? So all of those kinds of things are ways to bring the person into that experience. Um, so engaging interactions can include certain paths to follow. So you might take a path that tells you one story or a different path to tell a different story. Um, using Disney Imagineering terminology, we can have attractors that they call weenies um, so that you are dr drawn to those areas. And those areas are the pertinent areas that are going to give you the most information for that experience to be meaningful. Um, gameplay is another one. You're having AR with games, sort of the, the Pokemon Go, Niantic kind of thing. We need to see a lot more of that to engage people, especially a younger generation. So families that travel are often multi-generational now. So it's great to have the kids do something that they can share with the grandparents who then say, oh yeah, you know, this little bit of history, I know a little bit more about that. Um, and then again, the, we could have avatars that actually control the, the experience for the tourists that have some AI interactions. I think that's pushing that, that bleeding technology edge. But I think within five years, we will see AI uh, conversational agents that can help you determine what part of an experience you want to see. OK. so. Now, for the users, there's also technology challenges. So back to Mark. Right. So um, yeah, for usability, uh, we want to make sure as we're doing the development pipeline that it's still usable for the most amount of people. So there's just the fact that it's an app. There's like the time investment involved for getting the app up on your phone. And it might not be suitable for everyone if you're using like heavy uh, like graphics uh, unit and heavy uh, camera use. Um, not everyone could handle that necessarily. And also using like the camera, the Wi-Fi, the GPS, the um, the graphics all at the same time can drain a battery pretty quickly as well. So we're trying to make it uh, usable and efficient at the same time. So to um, manage, manage all this, uh, smart apps management, like uh, Google Instant Apps is uh, one way that's uh, kind of becoming more popular. Say people don't have much storage on their phone or um, just install from a website and let it run and then it's gone. Um, also, uh, like the Google Transactions, you might not have to log into a server every time, so cut down a little bit on the time overhead. 
And um, you can be smart about the use of the GPS and the Wi-Fi, um, only using it when you need to and shutting it down, um, and then just uh, switching to the local use uh, of SLAM or other technologies to keep tracking. So uh, then to test it, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to test um, for multiple devices using test clouds and uh, Google uh, Firebase and uh, what is it, Xamarin, I think, uh, have a couple of those and we're looking into others. But um, there are also testing criteria that can't be universally optimized um, even across devices. So the condition of the device, the variable conditions of the site, and how well it'll work uh, for the particular phone. So um, one thing we need to do for that is just make it like the least common denominator. Will it work with the crappiest device, something that's like <laughs> completely full of other apps and memories bad and everything else, and the worst possible site? Like if you have a lot of people walking by the marker, or if you have a lot of um, like bad lighting and occlusion from like trees, and it's variable occlusion because the branches wave. So um, trying to get that going is important for us so that we can have a baseline to work from. Okay, Mark, uh, we're out of Thanks. time, but I would like to uh, perhaps see if we have any questions for you that we can maybe hit our first one. Where can we go today to experience some of these tours? Well, we're um, still working on our demo. We have um, the uh, portable uh, demo that we're going to be able to show in a week or so that um, because our first uh, tour was going to be at the National Gallery of Art, um, the Sculpture Garden in DC. And one of the uh, sculptures there is this enormous metal tree. And so we're having some interactions uh, with the tree and also, as uh, Jackie was pointing out, the what ifs. Like what if, um, for instance, the uh, turkey instead of the eagle had been chosen as our national emblem. Um, and so being able to uh, see all of it on site is uh, the first goal. And also to get a showcase, we're looking at uh, Fredericksburg, where we're based, because it's a very historical town. And uh, Pauline, our CEO, has a lot of connections there that we can use to get a good uh, prototype going. So. Um, yeah, the, the tours aren't available yet, but um, Augmented Expeditions is starting up, and the first tours will be on the East Coast in Virginia and D.C. And if you're interested in getting on the mailing list, you can go to that augmented-expeditions.com website and, and send a, an email, and there'll be a, um, you know, a list. So when things launch, we can tell. Very good. Okay. Yep. And one more, um, just in particular, we are looking for um, people who have solutions on this and might want to partner with us in terms of development, and also uh, people who might want to partner us with us in terms of tours and content. So if there are um, SDK developers or content developers or people who are just interested in AR tourism, uh, come up to us. Let's hear it for Augmented Expeditions. <laughs>